Welcome back to Take a Leap and Transform, a neodiversity journey. I'm your host, Joseph K. Muscat. Are you ready to take a leap with me? We often say that in order to break the rules, you first must master them. And the same can be said that in order to lead your team, you first need to know your team. In either case, the dynamics is dependent on having a system in place that supports your team to achieve the results you are after. The problem lies on whether the system is adaptable or does it need to be replaced entirely to support many talents within your organization. Today, I'm joined by Simon Preston, and together we talk about the systems within your business. Simon is a passionate about neodiversity and particularly interested in the generations of progression opportunities that will unlock the true potential of neodivergent employees so that organizations can also see the benefit. Simon has known himself to be a neodivergent since 2000, dyslexia, and then in 2019 was formally diagnosed with autism. In addition to his neodivergent strengths of hyperfocus and perpetual problem solving, he has discovered his effectiveness in analyzing environments, visualizing systems, and supporting people in identifying synergies between internal environments, factors, and the talents and challenges that neodiverse employees can bring to an organization. Using these skills, he has adapted a combination of different strategic management and strategy generation tools to create a framework for managers to use in creating a psychological safe inclusive team culture. Welcome, Simon. Thank you. It's good to be here. Well, it's great to have you. With every guest, Simon, who is neodivergent, I like to ask a little bit of a background about them, especially in regards to when in their life did they get their diagnosis, which you already kind of indicated in your bio there. So can you tell me how that came to be and how that has affected you? So please tell us your story. Yeah, so I'll, um, I've first became uh, diagnosed with dyslexia in 2000 and that was largely because it was found that I was having difficulties with um, remembering information, processing information and generally the the usual uh, telltale signs of words moving around and switching uh, letters around and things. So um, when I was at the university um, I was then assessed uh, for uh, uh, for dyslexia and uh, that's where how I got that uh, diagnosis and uh, it did make a a difference because uh, the degree I was doing at the time was mathematics anyway so there wasn't a a great deal of reading to do um, but there is a lot of processing information and problem solving and uh, and the support I I had in in terms of additional times in examinations, et cetera, did, did actually help. Um, uh, it wasn't until, uh, in terms of the autism, I was uh, diagnosed formally uh, in 2019. And uh, that was after um, quite a few years of um, challenges, because uh, in 2010, I had a family tragedy. Uh, it suddenly my, my daughter passed away. And uh, with that sudden and unexpected turn of events, it uh, really disrupted what I thought I had uh, was my life under control. And uh, and then, uh, yeah, things started to spiral, got very turbulent and very difficult. And then um, it led towards a diagnosis of, of autism um, because of the traits I was exhibiting. Well, first off, on behalf of myself and the listeners, our condolences uh, for your loss. And thank you for sharing that with us. Let's kind of look back here for a second, because, I mean, you've had two late diagnoses. And what do you think, you know, just from looking back, why was it missed? Why wasn't it caught earlier? I think it's um, probably because I was, um, well, dyslexia and autism wasn't as well known and understood uh, back then. Um, Because we're talking sort of over 20 years ago now. And uh, I think uh, that's understanding behind those those particular conditions has, has uh, grown quite quite significantly in that time and um and also i was uh, develop i must have developing the the coping strategy to be able to uh, to get by but when i think about sort of when i was at school uh, i was in the top sets for science-based um lessons mathematics definitely was up there and uh, 
you know, science as well, anything that was more sort of practical, visual. Um, but when I was uh, for English, uh, I was in the bottom set. And, uh, you know, because I really struggled with comprehension, I was very, had a lot of difficulty getting my thoughts out onto paper. And um, I think because I was perceived to be a high performer in, in other subjects that there may have been a sort of, it may have not been discovered then at that point. It wasn't until it was a, it was a chemistry teacher at, um, at, the co- at college that, um, that picked up that I was having major difficulties with the symbols and uh and that's when it sort of came, came about yeah it's kind of funny that um it's quite often the case from from my experience and and talking to fellow neodivergents that <clears throat> when you're doing exceptionally well they t- tend to think that there is an issue and they don't they don't connect the dots and it's it's kind of funny in your situation that you're doing well in sciences but you're doing poorly in english there, there must have been, you know, a lot of, there should have been anyways, a lot of head scratching going, you know, something, something doesn't make sense here, but it, it wasn't caught. Um, it's really interesting. You know, I mean, my, my daughter recently was diagnosed. And again, it's, it's considered a minor diagnosis. But because she was doing exceptionally well, it just didn't get caught. And if, because we were so aware of it, you know, because of my neodivergence, you know, we saw particular signs that they weren't seeing. So again, it's that 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 whole scenario that's because you're doing well, they're they they're blind to the fact that there's something going on. And that's yeah, I completely agree. I completely agree. It's because it, what happens then is that they tend to because they think that there's nothing actually wrong. It's it's as though you're giving the impression, oh, you're coping with the demands. But actually what's really going on behind the scenes is you're having to work a lot harder to be able to, 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 to be able to be perceived to be coping and actually perform in that sense. And I think that that's where the misconception really lies and um, that neurodivergent people are having to work a lot harder to achieve the things that they do. I think the other thing I'm just thinking off the top of my head now too is that... <clears throat> There could be the logic that it could be an issue that they're thinking maybe it's an issue with the teacher or it's an issue with the subject, not necessarily an issue that the student is having. So again, there's that 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 disconnect, not putting the dots together. So you get your diagnosis for dyslexia in 2000, and then 20 years later, you get a diagnosis with autism. So you mentioned coping mechanisms, but before we get into the coping mechanisms, how did those two diagnoses at even at those two different time periods change your life in your career direction the two diagnoses together may uh, really sort of cemented my understanding of who i am and when i think about a lot of the decisions that i've made in the past and how i've um, responded to situations like like my, my daughter's death and things it's started to make a lot of sense it also made me realise that there's actually was nothing wrong with me, and uh, and that and that and that is a, a real life changing feeling because I, I did go through quite a bit of time thinking that I'm I'm a problem and uh, and um, you know blaming myself for for all sorts of things. And once I had the, that diagnosis for autism, I actually uh, I actually burst into tears because it was a relief um, that actually uh, there's nothing wrong with me i'm just different and it's great to be different and so if anything it started to make me sort of reevaluate what what i can do and uh, the pandemic itself also um was was a prime opportunity for me to start making some changes and um during the pandemic uh, because my usual way of teaching is is quite dynamic uh, you know I like to use my hands and uh, doodle on the whiteboards when I want to describe some things on but all that was uh, pretty much stripped away from me when the pandemic hit and I wasn't as skilled on the IT as as, as I've learned to develop since so that was quite a sudden shock to the system and that's made me sort of rethink things and that's why I decided to 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 uh, study an MBA and uh, so now it's kind of because of my own life experience, because my children are so uh, diagnosed uh, autistic, 
um, and also because of the the NBA, have started to sort of shape a new direction, if you like, um, that I think is more me. And also, you know, I can make a difference. And uh, yeah, so yeah, the, 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 the diagnosis has really helped me to really understand the benefits as well as the challenges that, that comes with being neurodivergent. Yeah, I totally see that. Now you said that you, you mentioned there that you've moving yourself into a new direction. Can you can you describe that a little bit? Yes, I mean I've I've been in uh, uh, teaching mathematics for quite some time, um, and I've also been in positions of leadership and management for mathematics as well. And uh, I think the the new direction really is in is much more down the inclusion route and uh, try and, and trying to sort of develop the um, the application of of the social model of inclusion and uh, to be more in, to to move away from integration and more into inclusive practice now this is both in education and in businesses and uh, because having also studied uh, the mba at the moment it's really sort of opened my eyes as well to what the gaps are out there and what uh, how new neurodiversity really is and um, i've even now got to the point now where i feel confident to uh, to start thinking about a phd once i've finished too and uh, so I'm definitely going more into the direction of the neurodiversity space now um, and away from mathematics education. So I, that, that, that's a perfect segue because <clears throat> I want to move into what, what, why you're here, uh, which is I really wanted to talk, move the conversation towards systems because there's quite the tackle there. And I've, I've developed a set of systems for myself and through talking to businesses, individuals, it's all about getting them to develop inclusive systems and changing how they think in regards to how things were and how things should be with a new system. So let's start off there. What do you see with what is wrong with the current system? I think that uh, in terms of the current system uh, for neuroinclusion is that there's a, an overemphasis of the medical model when it comes to making adjustments. And what I mean by that is that uh, the way the medical model views disability is that it's the person that is disa that is disabled. The person is the one with the disability and therefore needs fixing. And, and I think the, the, the problem with that is that the adjustments then are about fitting a neurodivergent person into a neurotypical system. And that's not inclusion. That's that's integration. And I think there's a misconception there uh, between the two. Whereas with the social model of inclusion, it's about how the, the environment that a neurodivergent person goes into um, is disabling for, for them to be themselves and, and also to uh, think about not just about adjustments for the challenges that a neurodivergent person has, but also, you know, how do they manage the talents as well? Because the, the great thing about neurodiversity is, is that there, there are there obviously are challenges, but there are some absolute real strengths as well, real talents as well, and and that is uh, tends to be underutilized uh, when the medical model is applied. So I think it's the understanding there that it's it's much more about how an environment functions, and how um, and how a neurodivergent person is able to um, be able to be themselves and use and really embed the talents as well as uh, considering the, the, the challenges that they have. I like that. I like the, the contrast between integration versus social inclusion or the social model, you know, because I mean, in the end, you're 100% you're right. It's trying, I, I often put it in the aspect of <clears throat> the system is a square system and anybody who's not a square is forced to try to fit into a square system. And that's not only, it's integration, but it's force integration. Where whether when we come up with, as you put it, a more social model or or, or a more holistic approach, then you're looking at how everyone is affected rather than just that one individual. Because because when you put the individual aspect, you're isolating that individual. <clears throat> you're kind of saying that that individual is the overall problem rather than really looking at how the system is 
ostracizing that particular individual. Yes, that's right. I mean, there's a really good meme on, um, uh, that's been going around on LinkedIn. Uh, I can't remember who authored it, so I apologize to whoever that was. Um, but about square peg in a round hole, you know, when bashing a square peg in the round hole, it's not that the bashing, that the using the hammer is hard, it's the, it's the fact that you're destroying the peg. You know, and 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 that's and that's is in a nutshell when it referring when we're saying about um, when trying to bash a square peg into a round hole, we're talking psychological safety, and and that's where um, you know the, the the adjustments need to be sort of not just about the functionality, but also to protect psychological safety. So let's go back here because you mentioned that. When we take a look at the at the model, it's looking at the the medical model, uh, which is, from what I recall from our conversation, I don't think you said it here. It's an out of date model, the, the 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 model of disability. So we have human resources, who again, who are a product of this square outdated system, working on this disability model, which is currently the law in the UK. You know, if we take a look outside of the UK, you know, we, we have variations of that in different regions. Like in the United States, we have, they have the Disability Act. Uh, I think Canada has something similar. And here in Malta, there is a, a similar Disability Act model. Um, so, Let's start off with there, because when we start trying to narrow down the obstacles that are put into place and how and why that system's out of date, what is wrong with that particular legislation? I think with, um, with the actual legislation itself, it's quite, although it's, it's a good legislation, but um, it, it can often lead itself open to interpretation. Uh, and that's where um, there are still issues. And so when places are building their HR policies and, pr and procedures, it's, it can still be very much designed for neurotypicals in mind. And so when, when um, as uh, for an example, somebody needs an adjustment to a policy, uh, a common response to that is, well, it needs to be fair for everyone. The thing is, is that the reason why the adjustment's being asked for is actually because it's not fair now. So it's more for sort of how our policies are being reviewed now. So that way it encompasses everybody, um, irrespective, uh, from a neurodiversity perspective, of course, uh, you know, irrespective of the, uh, the neurotype that they have. And we're talking not just neurodivergent, we want to include neurotypicals as well, because neurodiversity is about everybody not not just neurodivergent people so yeah so i think in terms of legislation the legislation is is a really good starting point but uh, it, it can be left open to interpretation yeah i mean i like what you said there that it's not fair now you know so so how can it be fair for everyone if it's not fair for everyone now it's it's kind of a contradiction in that particular argument or reasoning to try to keep things the way it is so then if we look at that model of how the legislation is open to interpretation and it's not fair now, then that kind of leaves how that kind of leaves the hands of HRs kind of tied because they've been trained to go and follow the, this particular legislation, especially in regards to the requirements of the company. So how can HR change or adapt? to moving away from that model, but still using that because they have to, because it's the current law of the land. I think it's very, I, 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 my opinion is that I think that HR have got a, 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 a big difficulty because I think really it sits with the lead, overall leadership and management of an organization of which HR is a function of. And because the people at the top are the ones that set the culture, uh, they're the ones that set the strategy and so on. And so how, how the company culture is and, and their ethos will play much more of a part as to what HR can do. Um, so I do think that HR have, do have this, find this difficult. And however, 
that does not mean that they can't that people can't learn and i think trying to sort of understand things much more from a environmental perspective um rather than just as a, an individual perspective um i think is a is a is a step forward for them. Okay, so let's move on to access to work. In the UK, you have access to work. Now, of course, that is part of the system and it's seen as being a solution to the system. So, but obviously that is falling into as well, being out of date potentially um, and being an obstacle. So how is access to work a benefit or an obstacle? Is it both? Is it more, more or less one way or the other? I think it's. I think it's an absolute benefit. Um, there, but again, it's it's all about how it is applied in an organisation. So, access to work uh, are able to give resources to and fund resources for um, people with uh, people who are disabled to be able to. Um, do their jobs basically uh, and give them the support that they need. And uh, but I think that it's, it depends on the, the how a an organisation may use this um, as to whether they use it as a tick box exercise or whether the, there is a strategy behind the implementation of the resources that that are provided by Access to Work. And and this comes down to sort of the the ethos and the beliefs of, of an organisation. So uh, an example would be neurodiversity training. Um, I know a very neurodiversity awareness training is a really good start point. Uh, it's, um, it's been known to be effective for addressing uh, explicit bias, uh, which is behaviors uh, and their attitudes. What is actually be, uh, not as effective for implicit bias or unconscious bias. So what tends, which is around, centered around beliefs. So what then tends to happen that is without the training without the follow-ups to the neurodiversity training the environment can very quickly go back to as it was before the training because the, the the professional development can quite often be forgotten about if not practiced and practiced and practiced um so it does very much depend upon sort of what the follow-ups are and how and how the the, the this the, the support is embedded properly and reviewed regularly yeah absolutely that's something that's not only in, in my consultancy but with other consultancies there's this hurdle that you find with businesses you're hired for a half day or a full day training and that could be you know two or three days let's say it or versus one day and then they're like okay great job is done they fail to realize that there needs to be that follow-up because that follow-up acts as an accountability as well where you're following up with the, the trainees, um, in this case, that's management, to ensure that A, if they need further questionings or further training, that follow-up's able to, to reinforce what they learn. And second of all, it's also to help shape them and guide them to not fall back into bad habits, that unconscious, you know? And what happens is statistically, from statistically, if it's just a training, you see a 20% improvement versus training and follow-up equals 80% improvement because you're, 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 you're catching those issues. That's right. And, then, and it's uh, because the, the actual awareness training sets up the good intentions, but without the implementation, you're not going to get the impact. Uh, and and that's, uh, that, that definitely makes sense with the statistics. Now, we're still looking at the system here in particular of what's wrong with the system. And we had discussed during our prep talk about a conversation I've had with an HR professional in the UK about the, the rise of the tribunal situation and even the situation that was happening prior to the rise of the tribunal situation, where, again, if we look at a, a particular scenario here, Simon, I'm, I'm your manager. We have a very good relationship. You're doing well on the job, but there, there happened to be an error. And I had come up to you to, to talk about the error. And then all of a sudden you completely explode, catch me off guard as, as the scenario that I've been painted. So I'm, I'm painting the scenario that, 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 that's been given to me. And then that leads into a tribunal situation where you are claiming that you were discriminated against. And it's kind of like, as this scenario has been painted, this complete, I don't know how to put it, 
a Jacqueline Hyde moment that came out of nowhere. So this is the, the situation that's been pictured, painted towards me. And this, this is what I've painted towards you in the audience now. And there's this, you know, this obviously extreme case or cases now apparently situation that's led up to this. Obviously, there's something else going on that's not been identified and not been recognized. So let's start with that. I mean, obviously, during the pandemic, we have seen that there has been a, a heightened awareness of neodiversity. And there's been a, this huge push of neodiversity awareness. And because of this huge push of neodiversity awareness, there's now been this increase of the tribunal situation. But obviously, there's, there's this backstory that either hasn't been recognized or hasn't been fully told, and we don't have the full picture. So from your perspective and from your understanding of what I've described here, what do you think is going on? What's what's going on from this? You and I having a great relationship as, as you're an employee and you're a member of my team as your manager. And then all of a sudden we have this, this huge scenario that's happened. And granted, this is not the scenario for all the cases, but this is what's one of the situations that's been developed or painted a picture for. I think with, with the, these kind of scenarios, they are because um, there is that sharp, like you said, the sharp, there's a sharp increase in number of employment tribunals that relate to new adversity. Um, and I believe that there, there is um, some research going into, into that at the moment. Um, so I don't know how frequent that this, that this particular sort of example uh, occurs, but I wouldn't be surprised if this does occur. Um, and I mean, when, when we think about someone who, who is uh, effectively triggered uh, by something that was said, um, what's, it's not necessarily all down to the manager here in the sense of um, being the root cause of that trigger. Like I said, it might it was a good re relationship um, and something is triggered off. So I think that there needs to be sort of a good look around sort of the wider environment. Uh, what's the working relationships like with co-workers? Um, what's, the, what's, what's it like working for the actual company itself? And also thinking about personal factors, uh, what's happening at home? and so on and it's really about sort of getting to the bottom of understanding what has led to this um this blow up um because quite often i mean one thing uh, that you know that autistic people are good at and myself including this is is masking and so um you, you can mask when you're at work give that give that impression that everything is okay um but then something just twigs something triggers and, and then then that's that's it it's um it, it can really set you off you can have a full meltdown breakdown um even shutdowns and um you know there could be a multiple number of factors that are built up to that and i, I like to use this sort of analogy of of, of um, when you're chopping a, a tree you know there's only so many times you can keep chopping until it starts to fall um so i think it's sort of keeping a, 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 a to try and prevent these things from happening is to is to try and sort it is to look for sort of telltale signs um like uh, withdrawal uh, or not not um, not contributing to conversations as much or as um, as before um you know is there a is it starting to be difficulties in punctuality you know someone looking exhausted it's just looking for these sorts of welfare signs and um and sit and seeing and and acting upon them even if it's just a, a quick check-in doesn't have to be a sit-down conversation to make it formal but it can be just sort of how are you doing how are you getting on i mean i read in a, one of the articles i'm reading at the moment for for my dissertation and um, about um that a manager took um yeah, took took uh, their their employee to to their cafe and uh, had a coffee and just had a talk about anything um, just to open up and and have a conversation. So there was it was moved to a friendly environment that didn't feel like the person's under scrutiny and uh, and that allowed the employee to open up. So I, I think it is um, you know I, there are times where. You know, a meltdown is, is can be very, very intense, uh, and and it certainly is. And uh, I think also how HR and management react to that 
can also play its part too. Yeah, the, the reaction of management is, is a tricky one, especially if they haven't had the training in regards to neo-diversity awareness, which then leads to the opposite reaction that management should be having to these particular situations. Now, hmm, I like what you said there, the the welfare checks, what what is going on? But if someone who's neo-divergent is good at masking, how how can one be aware of the welfare signs if if they can't see them? I think it's um, looking at other signs like um, you know punctuality is it can be another one as well, um, and also you know performance as well because uh, if performances start to not be sort sort to be out of character, um, then that can also be a sign as well. Um, so if there's a, a, a um, for example, difficulties meeting the targets um, that have been set, then, you know, which is out, out of character, then that can be also a, a sign as well. So it's, it's, it's sort of change, it's just changes. But um, yeah, I get your point though about the masking side of it uh, because you can cover that up, but then even holding the mask up can get exhausting. Yeah, I, I agree with that aspect. It definitely is exhausting. So then what if a company decides that perhaps the best way to try to alleviate the situation is that they come up with an internal tribunal and where an individual uh, who's having issues, let's say in, in the scenario that I painted earlier, where you have an issue with me because of that criticism, let's say, of, of, of trying to correct you in this one particular area that, that, that you had difficulty with, or I felt that you had difficulty with, where you can go and anonymously say that you have an issue. Would that work or is that counterproductive? So it, you're, you're, what you're describing is a, um, a safe space in a sense to be able to raise a concern anonymously. So um, yeah, I think, uh, no, I think that would be an option, definitely. Um, because I mean, like with anything to do with an anon, uh, uh, I can't even say that word anonymity. <laughs> so uh, you know, it, obviously the person who's having the difficulties won't um, won't be uh, necessarily identified, um, but it can actually flag up to leadership management that there is an issue and uh, that there could potentially be a training need needed and and. Uh, you know, a discussion can take place. Um, I think also having um, neurodiversity networks as well is really, really important. Uh, so that way that there's a safe space there for um, for people to share their difficulties and challenges they have, but have a sponsor from a senior member, a senior leader, uh, who can then take that information forward to their uh, corporate level meetings um but i think that when uh, when somebody is having a, a a crisis point like that i think it's a, a question of sort of coming away from talking about performance and things and switch straight to a welfare mindset uh because that person is is, is you know is has been impacted upon uh, psychologically and I think that having some sort of interim, because I find with a lot, of, you know, think you think of grievance policies as an example. There's a lot of sort of having an informal conversation is the first uh, port of call, but um, I don't I don't feel that that necessarily works um, because informal conversation then very much depends upon um, usually the line manager, unless it's the line manager that's being complained about, um, trying to tackle the situation themselves. And if they haven't had the neurodiversity training uh, or awareness or, or understand neurodiversity, uh, then that can actually uh, sort of flare up the incident rather than, uh, rather than de-escalate it. Um, but I think that having, um, you're saying like an internal tribunal, I think having that facility where someone can go to um, and talk out what's what it is that has triggered them off when they're in a position to talk about it, obviously. Um, if they can do that with a, with a nominated person, uh, then that may then 
help to um, co-regulate uh, with the individual, uh, which will help de-escalate the situation. Because I find with the, with a lot of the research we've been doing, that co-regulation is is a really really good uh, effective technique for managers to use. Um, if a neurodivergent uh, employee is 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 triggered off, um, I had a manager once who was who was incredibly good at that, um, and she um, was uh, whenever I was set off, it work then became secondary, and it was much more about sort of de-escalating. Um, any trigger, uh, the, the actual triggering scenario. And as it turned out, everything was fine. <laughs> so, you know, it, I think learning how to co-regulate with people, uh, which requires a lot of emotional intelligence training, is also uh, a really good technique that managers could learn to do and de-escalate it themselves. I talked a lot then. So. <laughs> yeah, no, that's fine. It's fine. So you also, what you're also talking about is, is, is conflict resolution training. Yeah. Um, yeah. And with neurodiversity in mind. With yes. neurodiversity in mind. And, and I like the aspect that you said there that putting the work second, the, the work is no longer important. It's about the person now. And let's take care of the person. And then once we take care of the person, then we can get back to, to the work aspect and, and handle the work aspect. Mm -hmm. Now, you mentioned, I mean, first off, I mean, you mentioned the aspect of, of, of a sponsor. I mean, first, the, there needs to be a system in place that promotes the use of sponsors you know whether and i i you you use the word sponsor i use the word mentor you know a workplace mentor that 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 neo-divergent person can go to but first that, that has to be established and then it, and if that isn't established then unfortunately that is a tool that's not available to an individual and you also mentioned the aspect if that person is able to articulate and speak up for themselves and, and of course, if they're not able to articulate and speak up for themselves, then even having an internal anonymous for whistleblowing option for that person to go to would, 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 would still fail because that person doesn't feel safe to be able to even verbalize what's going on. Okay, so I want to pause here for a moment, Simon, and I want to ask you about your own personal experience. I mean, you, you started to go there already uh during your career you must have faced your share of toxic atmospheres what were they and how they, were you able to handle them yeah I've, I've definitely been um i've i've had the um i don't know whether i want to say fortune or misfortune of, of experiencing two extremes and i've worked in an environment that has uh, been very inclusive um and and, and the app and the culture within the 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 organization itself was uh, was very collegiate there a lot of trust uh, professional trust in each other and whereas I, I've, I've worked in environments where it's completely opposite everyone's in competition with each other um, there are um, people that hold information back from you so you can't do your job and because they want to see you trip up and yeah, I, I've 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 experienced both sides of those, and, and when it's in those uh, the, the the toxic environments where um, where, the, where those sort of behaviours exist, it's it's very much the times where behaviours are tolerated and are not called out. And so, if you've got um, when you've got been given information uh, and you need information to be able to progress something that you're that I'm doing in my job. And then that information is held back uh, and purposely not passed on because they want to keep it for themselves. Um, you know, has a has an effect on me, and and because of that, my workload can pile up very quickly, and then that's when things can get very very overwhelming. Um, so, I've worked in environments where there has been gaslighting as well, um, where you know people are enforcing their version of reality as being the reality, uh, which then quite makes somebody question their version of reality. And I've been on the receiving end of that as well. And that is not one bit pleasant. Um, and um, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very difficult to explain because it can get quite emotional talking about it. Um, but that's, but that's, that's what happens. Um, and so, how I dealt deal with it. Um, well, it's 
it's a difficult one because the natural thing to do is move away. Um, and a lot of advice that people give to you is, oh, just leave. Um, but that's not always possible. It's not always possible. And so it can, um, it can really, um, if you let it, drive you right down into the ground, really. And so, I mean, I, I already have depression anyway because of my daughter's death. And uh, so I can be susceptible to, to relapses. Uh, so one thing that is definitely helping me is the fact that I have disclosed all my, all my conditions in the first place. Uh, because, because of all these conditions, uh, because I've got quite a, a system of them. <laughs> We're talking systems. Uh, I've got quite a system of conditions and, and they all do interact with one another. Uh, and I could talk all day about that as well. Um, but having that sort of uh, the, the, the occupational health um, supports, having the access to work support and things like that actually does help to put things moving in the right direction and uh, with authority because of the uh, because of the Equalities Act. So it is very much sort of you, you've got, yes, you have to try and self advocate, but there are services out there that can advocate for you because I, I don't always able to I can advocate for other people no problem but I find it very difficult to self advocate but I do know where I can go to that can help so it's um it very much depends on who who it is that's um that's working with me so yeah I mean it's it's making sure that that, that utilizing the the resources that are out there um and disclosing is 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 really key because if you don't disclose, then um, you know, you're not protected. I agree with you. Disclosure is key. And, and I mean, the, the, the challenging part is in disclosure is sometimes disclosure can be a barrier in itself because you can't get access to the resources that you're mentioning unless you disclose. And, and A, if you don't know if you're neodiverse or two, you're a private person and you don't want to disclose, then that in itself becomes a barrier. Um, and it's interesting, the aspect that um, I can relate, that you can easily advocate for others, but you, you have difficulty advocating for yourself. I mean, it's, it's, it's a typical situation for, for regardless of your neodivergent or not. Um, that's interesting. Thank you for sharing that, first of all. And so now that's, we, we've, we've looked at what the issues are with the current system. So then in, in, in this social model that you are talking about, this new social system, uh, which is very related to universal design. So then what is the system, system that businesses can develop into and what does that look like? I think with, it's changing the way that uh, a business would think about their teams. And uh, there's, Quite often, you can think of the whole, the team as a whole, um, from two different types of thinking. You've got the reductionist thinking, and then you've got your systems thinking. And reductionist thinking is, is a, a view that the whole is made up of the sum of the parts. Um, whereas with systems thinking, it's about the whole and the interaction between the parts, which depersonalizes it somewhat. Now, I, I mean... I, I like, like to describe uh, systems um, uh, like how football teams play, as an example. Um, when you think of a, a football team, 11 players on the pitch, all moving, you know, moving around the pitch. And if you think if you're able to draw a line in between each of those players, you, that's a line that is like demonstrates the, uh, the interactions between those players. And if, that, if those interactions are solid, then you've got a team that's going to perform. Uh, and and I love seeing these 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 systems moving up and down, <laughs> moving up and down the the pitch as well, and how they hold their formation and things. But if you've got a team of people who who are all sort of say a football team, you've you've signed all these superstars. If they don't know how to pass the ball to each other or read each other well, uh, they're not going to win their games. Um, and so you know, having a team that that can read each other well and understand each other and how each other plays. Is is leads towards successful football teams, and I think there's 
you know, quite a bit to learn from that from a, from a business perspective. Because if you've got a team who all understand each other well, know what each other's strengths and challenges are, you know, and play to everybody's strengths and support each other with the challenges, then that's a system thinking approach to um, leading and managing a team. And I think this is where sort of neurodiversity is, 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 a, is a beautiful thing because that team can have, can be neurodivergent people, neurotypical people. It, it really doesn't matter. Everybody has got their strengths and their challenges and the talents and their challenges and are working together for the collective good. So that's that's uh, that's my view on that on systems thinking with uh, with with the social model of inclusion. I really like that analogy. That football analogy is, is frankly so beautiful because when you look at a football pitch and you see a team of eleven players, you know how they go up and down the pitch, and everybody has their place. But despite having their place, they know how to to to, to support one another and focus on strengths. It's a really great analogy. Now. That analogy, that system, I mean, you mentioned, um, what was it again? You mentioned uh, reduction and... Reductionist and system thinking. Yeah. Sorry, there we go. You mentioned reductionist and system thinking. Now, your model there is also based on two other systems. Uh, can, you, can you explain what those other two other systems are and, and how they're integrated? The McKinsey 7S is a, is a, is a real, I find is really good for uh, social inclusion uh, because it's it's a it's based on analyzing a team's um uh functionality basically how do they work well together um under the seven elements that uh, that mckinsey uh, uh had um, identified and uh, so looking at so the, the strength uh, looking at the strength uh, strengths and weaknesses under each of those seven elements is a really good starting point um and uh, a team can then see how functional their team actually is they're a high high functioning team where they've got a good balance between all those seven elements or is it a dysfunctional team where there's not a balance or it's or it's very or each of those elements are not running very very well but it's not about it's it's about the interactions between the elements that really makes makes the difference and that's why i think that that fits the social model of inclusion really well when it comes to analyzing a team as well as thinking about how a new divergent person could be part of that team um, now the other thing is the uh, it's the model I was been play, I've been playing around with uh, using the uh, the toes matrix, which is the extension to a SWOT analysis, um, and uh, that model that I've been playing with is uh, where it, when you've analysed the team's strengths and weaknesses, but then you cross reference that with the neurodivergent employees' talents and their challenges. So that way, when you you're looking for strategies that embed the neurodivergent talents within the team strengths and also to improve on team weaknesses that then can lead towards that improved business performance uh, because everything is improving you're amplifying the strengths and you're improving on the team weaknesses so that will lift the team that's the contribution and um, but then you can look at how the team strengths could support with the challenges so the internal modifications uh, to improve the overall team functionality that supports the neurodivergent person that's a cost-effective way of, a, of, of an adjustment. But then it's also that psychological safety and looking at the times where um, team weaknesses could actually impact the challenges. Uh, so if you've got a team that uh, isn't, isn't strong with their communication skills, that will impact on someone who has difficulty with social communication. So that that is a particular that that is a potential trigger in scenario that then can be um, a, a risk assessment can be created to mitigate that from occurring. So that's so using the toes matrix and McKinsey Seven S together could actually give um, give teams uh, uh, team managers team leaders um, a real opportunity to sort of look at things from more of an inclusive perspective and not just look at how to make adjustments for the challenges and not considering the talents. What I like about that is that using two existing systems that businesses and management are already familiar with, and it's just adapting it to, to a different perspective that they haven't considered before. And it leans into transitioning towards that new social model system 
to replace the old system. Uh, so that's really uh, that's what I really liked about that. And having that understanding and explanation can lead the way to that change. I, I have found Simon this whole entire conversation really fascinating um, and very profound. So and 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 it's very promising what this what this is introducing and in, in changing mindsets uh, with business in 2022. So how can listeners find you? There's a couple of ways. I'm on LinkedIn. Um, so Simon Preston and uh, uh, FCMI. So I'm on, on LinkedIn. Um, email as well, simon at embraceneurodiversity.co.uk. Uh, probably those are the two best ways of getting in touch. Fantastic. So this brings us to, to an end of another episode. Thank you, Simon, for being such a great guest. I encourage you to get in contact with Simon and delve with him in how to take your business to new levels by developing the right system in your organization to include neurodiverse talent. I also want to thank you, my continued listeners, for your amazing support of this podcast. I want to share with you a new program that I put together to bring awareness to uplevel the skills of employers and management. The workshop aids in building more inclusive environments in the workplace and in developing the skills of management to be more engaging with their teams. Reach out to me on my website to learn more about this amazing program. I also encourage you to continue to support this podcast so I can bring you more amazing content. You can do so by visiting my Patreon page. Till next time, take a leap and transform.